So you think we're done? Uh Uh-uh, we're not done yet. This story just keeps getting better. Well, at the time, it didn't look like it was getting better, but it does make a much better story. So we're at the ready, set, go stage. The clock is connected. UART works when the voltage is lowered. The CPU works great. We can get the hello world after we loaded it with the UART. Everything is perfect. But what about our memories? Well, uh, they don't do anything, of course. Whatever we do, they always read out a one. If we look over here, what we do when we're reading out different rows of the memories, we get FFFFFFF, which, as you know, is 1111111. It doesn't matter what we write to them. We always, always, always read out a one. Ah! Reset? Well, after a few days of searching for a needle in a haystack, we actually found the problem. The memory macro has a reset input. Why does a memory macro have a reset input, you may be asking? Well, we decided to put it in there to disconnect the sense amplifiers uh, uh, during reset. And when we do that, the memory outputs a constant one, which actually looks exactly like what we were reading out from the chip. But why will we be giving it a reset? Well, because the SOC has a reset underscore signal, and that means that it's active low. So when we release reset, we're actually raising it, and the memory is getting reset. And that means that we are constantly in reset whenever the sock is working. And this is really bad. How did that happen? Well, it's another potential point of failure, the behavioral model. Logic simulations are run with a Verilog model of the IP, and that behavioral model is written by hand. The behavioral model, as you can see here, had a reset underscore in it and an always at neg edge reset to show what the behavior of the macro is. But the macro itself was uh, designed, uh, custom designed with a reset high signal and it was not equivalent. What is the solution? Well, always run at least basic mixed signal verification. I mean, when you take, you know, the Verilog wrapper, uh, and get rid of this model, put it into you know the analog simulator, and run together the digital um, wrapper with the uh, real actual block. But sometimes, you know, especially in our cases, you see that we're cutting corners, and when you cut cut corners, things just don't work. So the chip is dead. Oh no! After this whole story, what we're going to do is throw it away. Well, not so fast. We still have one rabbit up our hat, and that rabbit is called the fib. A focused ion beam is a machine that enables post-fabrication circuit editing. So it's a really big and really, really expensive machine that allows us to go and change the circuit after fabrication. At low currents, a FIB enables a high-resolution imaging, very similar to a SEM. So it shoots ions at the sample, the ions come back, and we can look at them and get an image from them. But when we use high currents, we can actually drill down or etch away into the chip, and we can do it at sub-micrometer precision. So you can really go and cut things away inside the circuit. And it can also be used to, to deposit a conductive metal layer, so you can actually go and make a new connection. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. Remember, we have metal layers and all kinds of things all over the place. So how are we going to do it? Well, luckily... We have a guy named Yoav, and he's an expert at using a fib. So he told us what to do. Step number one, simulate the fix. So we know that we want to get rid of reset, and luckily we don't even need the reset there. So all we had to do really is is cut off the reset, make sure it's always uh, tied to the unreset state. So we need to find a reset net that's close to the macro and connect it to VDD. So that we did in the kind of schematic of the uh, of the uh, the Verilog of the chip. We found you know a bunch of reset nets that we could connect to uh, VDD and then get rid of our reset over there. Okay. We put it into simulation, and we saw that everything is supposed to work with a fixed memory model of the macro. Okay, so now uh, we need to find a place to drill down into the chip. So that's a much harder thing, and we sat there for hours and hours with our GDSs and looked at different places. 
and we found different reg uh, regions where we could cut. So we see here we have to go up from the top metals and see where we're going to actually cut away and where we're going to actually deposit some metal and therefore be able to short it to one of the power nets. So we can go down, uh, that was uh, metal 9 to metal 8, and we can go up to metal 10 and metal 11 and see where we can safely cut through just layers that are usually going to be some VDD or VSS that it doesn't matter if we like really remove that whole area. Assuming all it will do is maybe affect the IR drop, but probably that's not a big problem. And step three is we actually go to the FIB. So it's all or nothing now. And we sit in front of the you know, screen that we see in the FIB and we're starting to look down inside the chip. And starting to go down, um, when we have, you know, a 1200x magnification, we can see our beautiful wire bonds. Okay, and then we go and we find our region of interest. So as you can see here, we go and we focus in on the chip and we start drilling down at a higher precision, taking away different parts. Um, and we can go down here and we're at a 10,000x precision over here. We go down into a 15,000x precision and we keep on drilling down and we keep on etching away parts of the, you know, the top layers and we want to see and stop when we get to the right layer. And we keep on going deeper and deeper into the chip and here we're already at a 35,000x resolution and we're making our hole down here and seeing different types of layers that we get over here um, and we can go and actually you know, connect a, a, our specific part where we see 150,000 X and a uh, type of view from the top and a view from the side to see what we did. Don't worry, the guys who work at the FIB, they actually know how to look at these things and know what they mean. But uh, believe me, uh, what they said is that they cut that wire there. And here goes nothing. We take the chip out of the FIB, we stick it into our board, we connect the USB-C, we hit reset, we load our program onto the computer, and boom, we have our zeros, which we didn't have before. And we can raise a glass. Our chip works. So what are the conclusions from this talk? Well, the first and major conclusion is to adhere to sign-off guidelines. Really, these sign-off checklists that you, you have, either at your workplace or in your academic environment, they were written in blood. Don't take them for granted. Every single thing there. And you can see that we cut corners in several places. Really, if you don't go with your sign-off checklist, things are not going to work. And that can really, really cause everything to fail. Second, you have to identify potential points of failure. As we saw here, there were several places that were really single points of failure that weren't actually automated and independently verified. And they're just bugs waiting to happen. Pretty much at every type of place that there is like that along the chip design flow, you're going to have a bug. So try to automate everything, try to have verification for everything, and really identify the points of failure that you can have and go and double and triple and quadruple check them. Patience and persistence, that's an important thing for anybody who hasn't actually done ramp up of a chip before. Nothing, 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 and you can see it in this presentation. Nothing ever works on the first shot, okay? So just don't give up. Don't give up. I've pulled out my hair so many times looking at chips, but there's always another workaround or fix. There's always something you can do in some type of way. You just really need to be persistent and find it. And finally, you got to know all the fine details. We are engineers. Nothing is magic in engineering. You have to know everything about everything that you're doing or else you won't be able to really solve the problem. Debugging is a mystery. It's like an escape room. You need all the clues to re reach the solution. So really make sure you know every single thing that's going on there. And if you don't, ask and figure out how it works. So I want to give a lot of acknowledgments here. Um, it really was an adventure, and it required a lot of help to get to the finish line. So everybody at the Enix Labs who helped us and at RAM Technologies, we went to Mazer in Holland to do the FIB, and we used Beckermos for the uh, bonding, and they also really came up to, to bat and helped us uh, fix the different problems that we had. So really uh, thanks to them for their help in the debugging process. And a special thanks besides everybody who really helped us around from Enix and from RAM, uh, to Udi Kra and Joab Weitzman, who were essential in this debugging, and to Jonathan Shoshan and Christoph Muller, who also had a really important hand in this. So that was all I had to tell you about um, Lupulus, and I hope you enjoyed.